Hi everyone, welcome back to the hashtag See Arthritis Facebook and Twitter live event. As you uh, know, if you've tuned into our first few interviews, we're here in Quebec City at the annual scientific meeting of the Canadian Rheumatology Association and Arthritis Health Professions Association annual scientific meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm really privileged to be sitting here today with Dr. Tom Appleton. He is uh, in the Department of Medicine at Western University. And his specialty area is one I know that is of great interest to our audience of osteoarthritis. Yeah. And you are here to talk to us today about two different things. One is the review course. You've been on the faculty that is teaching the new up and coming crop of rheumatologists and Arthritis Health Professions Association members. Um, and I loved the title of your course. Uh, of your session, Pearls and Myths. We know there are tons of myths surrounding osteoarthritis. You as a clinician, uh, may I call you Tom? Please. Okay, thank you. Um, Tom, really, uh, you deal with those every day. Um, the number one thing a person hears uh, or thinks of when they hear the word arthritis is very likely a myth. So, uh, welcome to our booth. It's really a pleasure to have you, and we want to just dive right in there. Tell us about the course itself and the process of training uh, young up-and-comers, um, and specifically about the course that, that you uh, participated in and led today, or last week, rather. Yeah, because it's actually been spread out over quite a few days. Virtual yeah. and in person. We're That's happy right. to be back here in person. Yeah, thank year. goodness. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's awesome that you guys continue to have the booth and thanks for having me come in. Oh, we're booth. always thrilled. You're the stars yeah. here. Well, it's nice, the to be, nice to be counted among them, but there are many <laughs> and there's a parade coming through. Yeah. I saw a lot out in the hall and so um, it will probably run close to on time. Yeah, right? excellent. Excellent. Um, so yeah, it, I mean, training uh, the up-and-coming rheumatologists, uh, and really this is so critical for our workforce going forward, is to have this group of people that are fresh and enthusiastic and able to kind of take the baton from, uh, you know, a, a rich history of lots of rheumatologists building up what we now take for granted, is, which is excellent arthritis care in yeah. Canada. Uh, but we have to keep things moving forward. We have to see new developments, and we also need to keep things going that, that have worked really well. So yeah. that's, that's what the review course is about. Uh, is, is bringing that content to people who are, you know, honestly at all stages of training, either looking for a refresher or, uh, you know, later in their career, just kind of, you know, trying to catch up on the latest things. Um, and then, you know, the, the trainees have their own focus day, which is, you know, we're running today. So the pre-course, you know, pre right? Course, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So there's, there's a huge amount of content. Um, it's great to be involved in that. Um, you know, the, the one that I was involved in last week was run by uh, Dr. Trudy Taylor and Dr. Shin Jamal, uh, the both coasts of the country. Yeah, uh, exactly. Together. So, exactly. So that's great to, yeah. to see that running year over year. Um, but yeah, we're talking about, about myths and trying to bring some of the pearls. You know, I think of pearls being not just the things that are evidence based and goal directed, like we know are effective for, for patients with arthritis, but also how to really tailor it to the individual patient. Right? So, how they can action it, how yeah. you action it in them, but how they can turn around in their daily lives and action it themselves. That's right. So, yeah. empowering the patient to be able to do that um, and to know when it's a good decision to proceed and when you want to kind of stop and maybe ask for some guidance, either talking to your rheumatologist, to your family doctor whether it's your other arthritis specialists, you know, physiatry, sport medicine, all, mm -hmm. all kinds of different people that we interact with throughout the course of our lives with arthritis. And so, you know, it's important that everybody kind of be on the same page that way. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, myths, uh, we're going to ask you to bust a few of them here <laughs> okay. uh, in the booth with us. Um, so, you know, you're seeing patients, you're doing research in this area, have for years, Tom, give us, I don't know, your top three. Yeah, sure. Um, and feel free if you have your any. I'm, I'm going to dive in. If I, yeah, okay. But uh, I think probably the, the most common one that I get, and, and this won't surprise you at all, but the most common one that we hear in clinic all the time is, you know, I've heard that I have this wear and tear arthritis. Am I going to hurt my joints? Am I going to make myself worse by exercising or by doing too much in that? And, you know, it's a, it's an obvious thing to think about because sometimes when you have arthritis, you know, darn it, it hurts. Yeah. Right? And it hurts to move sometimes. Uh, but we know from a large number of studies that have been done over literally decades that there is an overwhelming benefit to being physically active, to move.
moving, right? Yeah. And so, you know, over over long, long periods of time, we've seen that benefit play out again and again in many studies, and really no studies that have convincingly shown that there's any detrimental effect of exercise, yeah. right? So the myth is that exercise is going to make your joints worse. It's it, If anything, it's going to stimulate them and help them try to regenerate so overall be better. It's going to improve your function. Uh, but the other thing to watch out for, and this is the caveat in there, maybe the pearl, if you will, is, is the joint injury is a risk factor for yeah. progression, right? So whatever exercise it is that you're doing, and if you're trying to pick an exercise or talking to your doctor about the exercises that you'd like to do, first of all, make it something that you'd like, right? Something you actually want to do. And want like to don't take right? castor oil if you don't want to have to, <laughs> you don't right. have to get <laughs> Exactly. Uh, but also make sure you can do it safely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. so I think um, that is the big myth, thanks for busting it, and the pearl that goes along with the bust. Um, yeah, I think so many of us are afraid of breaking it. Right. it that's kind of how it feels when your uh, joints are inflamed or potentially have some sort of chronic, you know, injury or uh, like you did, the onset of osteoarthritis. Um, you're kind of worried about, oh, well, I, I don't want to make it worse. Right. And not doing anything is, in fact, it's making the, it worse. The worst. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Okay, so there you heard it first from uh, a world leader here. Um, okay, number two. Yeah, so there's there's quite a few. Um, I think probably some of the most common myths that we, we hear about are around types of medications or even supplements. Uh, so people often ask about, okay, well, should I take uh, glucosamine or turmeric or these sorts of, of things. And, you know, I think in all fairness, some of these things do have at least a biological rationale, meaning there might be a, a mechanism for how they might be anti-inflammatory. There's at least a plausible explanation for why it might do some things. Right. The problem with a lot of them is that the effect is so tiny yeah. that you just really question whether it's worth spending money on it at all. So that's the proposition. It's yeah. it's it's actually related to finances, right? Yeah. In a lot of ways, right? Yeah. And, you know, cost of living is always getting higher. We know this. I mean, food prices are crazy right now. You know, you've got to make decisions about how you're going to allocate your resources. You know, you want to put it on something that's going to be high value. So you yeah. really think about the concept of cost effectiveness. So if I'm going to pay something, I want to make sure that the value I'm getting back in return is appropriate for that amount of cost I'm putting in. And it may seem like a supplement for a month is not very much money, but over a long period of time, that can certainly build up. So yeah. you know, we want to make sure the things that we recommend are going to make a meaningful benefit. So they're going to meaningfully improve your pain or function or quality of life, or ideally all of the above. Yeah. Uh, and so you know what it, what it turns out is that pretty much most of the supplements that have been studied have yeah maybe this much benefit or not at all. Yeah, I think yeah. there's a uh, glucosamine now. The, the, the research is in on, on it, um, and I mean, while people may use it, may believe in it, the effect, highly likely placebo, mm -hmm. will have a duration, you know, yeah. placebo effect usually has a duration, yeah. but both here in Canada, I know Dr. Johan Seber did a really elegant trial, early days in, in glucosamine use, yeah. and then the NIH duplicated it, it quadrupled the budget. Right. Uh, and with really large numbers of patients, and uh, those results were all negative. Yeah. Um, so that's the kind of evidence base that you're pointing at, Tom, which is foundational to the recommendations then that you give your patients. I think a lot of people out in our audience think, well, doctors don't like vitamins and things because mm -hmm. it's something we can do on our own and we don't need them. But in fact, your doctor is on your side. Um, they're trying to not only help you and your health, they're also trying to help you manage some of the resources that you may be considering letting go of right. um, that are really important in your life. I mean, we know there are many benefits to exercise, gym membership. Maybe you trade, it's a trade off. Yeah. Maybe you trade away some of the money you're spending over here where there isn't evidence and you put it over here in the exercise realm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, okay, number two, number three, maybe I'm going to throw it at sure, you. Sure, yeah. Um, we still, we've been around for 23 years now, still here, well, arthritis is an old person's disease. I might get that when I'm older. And especially that would be true in osteoarthritis. And we now know the evidence is pretty clear that it's not. So, so there's the myth. It's not, an, it, it, that it's an old person's disease. So right. tell us the reasons why we know it's not an old person's disease. 
his shirt. So, so the association with age really comes from big epidemiologic studies that show that, you know, statistically, you're going to have more people who have an arthritis as you go up each kind of each decade or however you want to count age, right? Yeah. All relative. Yeah. I don't um, count it at all, by the way. That's anymore. good. That's yeah. probably the best way, right? <laughs> just sort of ignore that and just live young. What birthday? And, yeah. I don't have birthdays anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I hope COVID kind of did that too. Yeah, exactly. Forget about yeah. Um, but the, the reality is that most arthritis, certainly rheumatoid arthritis, other autoimmune forms, will start in the earlier decades of life. You know, third, fourth decade, we can certainly see juvenile inflammatory arthritis. Right. So childhood onset arthritis, that sort of thing. So they can affect the whole lifespan. Yes, absolutely, there are cases of onset later in life. That's absolutely true. But statistically, the vast majority of either autoimmune arthritis or osteoarthritis start in sort of that third, fourth, fifth decade. Yeah. Right? And people live with these diseases for many years, many decades. And so, sure, over time, you're going to accumulate more cases. So it's just the chronology of time. Right. But actually, there's a plateauing after about age 60, 65, okay. and you don't really see a lot of increasing rates after that age. Is that because of uh, people are taking greater risks with their skeletal system, maybe during the, the, those earlier years, like we're bike riding and having crashes, or we're playing soccer and we're sustaining an injury that we don't properly rehab? Is that part of why it plateaus off, because we're maybe not participating in higher risk sport or things, or is that... Just my failed hypothesis. It, it's a really good thought, and yeah. it probably does contribute a little bit. Okay. But if we look at injury-induced arthritis, it really only accounts for about 9 to 12 percent, okay. around 10 percent okay. of cases. So that probably makes a small impact. Okay. And that's probably really in the sort of teens, early 20s, where you're going to see most of those kind of cases arising. Yeah. So it's probably not just that. Okay. And, you know, really what we're seeing most often is the uh, this increasing number of comorbidities that people live with. So what I mean by that is your high blood pressures, your diabetes, the obesity, obesity rates, yeah. cholesterol, you know, all of these sorts of things that we accumulate more and more of over time. And those are much more strongly associated okay. with the risk at that age. So it's probably really that the joints are suffering with these additional things that they're having to deal with other comorbidities. And we're starting to learn a lot more now about the risk of arthritis with high blood pressure, the risk of arthritis with diabetes. And so yeah, it's a tangled do? web they weave. Yeah, yeah. It really is, yeah. right? So, you know, it almost becomes the straw that broke the camel's back after yeah. a while. So, you know, really reducing the risk of those things, increasing activity, you know, dealing with those kind of obesity risks and that sort of stuff is really, really key. And even if that isn't the underlying cause, it makes it a lot easier to treat if you can deal with those comorbidities. Right. So for our audience, Tom, when I'm, you know, one of the things I latch onto is, oh, if I do this for this thing, I'm actually improving this yeah, other thing. Yeah. yeah. Which is motivational. I mean, yeah. people, sometimes people lack motivation right. in actually addressing what's bothering them in terms of health. Um, so there's motivation for you folks. If you tackle one, you're probably tackling a few of these other things as well. Oh, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, in our remaining a few minutes, Tom, tell us about your current research. What's exciting you today? Is there anything you've learned um, from the research that you've been doing or the research that has been shared here at the meeting so far? Um, how is it changing patients' lives? I mean, that's we're the rubber that hits the road, this audience. Yeah. So, uh, you know, tell us what you're doing, but then also say, and this has had impact here, if you can. Yeah. I know research takes a long time, Yeah. Um, but we're very eager. Uh, sure. Because if we have a chance to not live in pain, to not live with loss of mobility, we'd rather do that. Right. Yeah. So there's lots of really exciting stuff that we're working on, and I'd, I'd love to unpack it all. But mm -hmm. just to kind of cover some of the highlights, you know, I'm a rheumatologist. I work on inflammation. That's what we know is kind of the language we speak. And so we're tr really trying to understand the role that inflammation plays in driving osteoarthritis forward. Um, there is a totally different type of inflammation that occurs in osteoarthritis than we see in rheumatoid arthritis, right? Which is more of an autoimmune kind of inflammation, right? right? And so in osteoarthritis, it's more of an innate kind of inflammation. We don't have good drugs available, good medicines to really treat that type of inflammation, and we struggle with that in other diseases as well. You know, cancer-associated inflammation is hard to treat because we're starting to see new, new 
and therapies come out along those lines. So we're going to see a big surge in new types of innate immunity kind of treatments. Okay. And that's, that's kind of where we think this field is going. So that's what we're working on. Um, one little example I'll give you. So we, we recently did a study, published this in, in the Journal of Oncology, showing that if your uh, inflammation is high, there's a particularly bad type of pain experience that people are, are, are suffering with. Just that. based on the inflammation? Just purely based on the presence of the inflammation that you measure inside of the knee. So we're studying knee osteoarthritis yeah. in this particular study. Yeah. So, you know, that told us that, okay, this, this constant pain experience that people report is particularly bad because it suggests that you're getting toward a later stage and you're more likely to have complications, knee joint replacements, those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and so we're really linking that inflammation with that, the development of that experience. The next thing we did, and we also recently published this, was looking at the effects of treating that inflammation, just with a general kind of approach, so just this, you know, steroid kind of approach, to see whether you could change the way people walk. So we measured the biomechanics, so people walking through a lab with the sort of white stickies on them, yeah. walking through, you can measure all these different angles. And after we adjusted for how much improvement in pain there was, there was an additional change in how people walked. It made them walk better. Sure. So, I mean, it makes sense, but nobody's ever shown that before, that by treating inflammation, you can actually change the way people are moving. And that was really important for us because we know that movement is so key to be able to go through your life, be able to function, enjoy the things that you like to do. And if we can use inflammation, which we know a fair bit about but have a lot more to learn, um, then that may be a really effective way of trying to treat this, this form of arthritis that people have always thought is non-inflammatory. Well, super cool type of research because you're bringing that biomechanical sphere of expertise together with, you know, actual joint injection, like the medicine yeah. approach, yeah, exactly. um, which is super cool. Um, I know you've got a ton more to tell us, uh, but we want to let you get back to the meeting. Um, Dr. Appleton, we're so privileged to sit with you again uh, this year. You come and visit us every year, and we love hearing from you. Uh, I know our audience is grateful, so thank you very much, and we uh, wish you well for the rest of the meeting. And enjoy La Belle Provence, Quebec. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much, merci beaucoup, for everything that you're doing to help the community and for having me here. So, ah, avec plaisir, avec plaisir. All right. See you again.